Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, PCI Change Detection, Thinking Beyond the Checkbox. Our presenters today are Tim Erlin, Director IT Risk and Str Security Strategist at Tripwire, and Glenn Rogers, CIO of the Girl Scout. Outs of Northern California. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be a part of today's webcast. So before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, please make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentation will be using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner to, to enlarge your slide deck. If you're not seeing slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing technical difficulty, please click on the help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console and covers most common te technical issues. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will be having a Q&A session during the last presentation. Also, feel free to submit comments via this widget. Also, please take our five-question survey during the webcast. We'd really like to hear from you. And lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast and the slide deck. So now let's get on with the presentation. Uh, just a bit about our speakers. Glenn Rogers has more than 20 years of technical and management experience in network and AMP, systems integration, vendor management, equipment procurement, and security audits and remediation. In December of 2007, Glenn became the acting CIO for the Girl Scouts of Northern America. That would be Northern California, sorry. Where he led the technology transition for five Girl Scout councils as they merged into the newly formed GS NorCal Council. Glenn also serves as the PCI Compliance Officer for GS NorCal and continues to oversee their adoption of new technology and IT support services and serves as an outsourced CIO to his other customers. Tim Erlin is Director of Security and IT Risk Strategist at Tripwire, responsible for the solutions and strategy. He previously managed Tripwire's vulnerability management product line, including IP360 and PureCloud. Erlin is actively involved in the information security community. His contributions include blogging, podcasts, press speaking, and television. So if you would like to know a little bit more about the speakers, click on the bio widget at the bottom of your screen. Now I would like to turn it over to Tim Erlin. Take it away, Tim. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for the um, introductions there. Very helpful. Um, today we've got a, a few different things to discuss, um, and um, we're really happy to have Glenn Rogers here to talk a little bit from uh, a real-life customer uh, experience with PCI. Um, we're going to spend a little time talking about how uh, PCI and uh, the, the Girl Scouts of Northern California uh, fit together, along with diving into the, the Requirement 11 uh, specifically. Uh, and we'll move from there into the Beyond the Checkbox portion of, uh, of the session, uh, and we'll finish off with a little bit about PCI DSS 3.2, which was um, recently uh, announced, uh, and a bit about how Tripwire can help with PCI, which um, is, of course, a, a requirement for a, a, a webcast like this. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Glenn uh, to talk a little bit about how the Girl Scouts and PCI DSS compliance go together. I, for one, uh, don't uh, associate um, uh, the Girl Scouts of Northern California with um, credit card processing, but uh, Glenn can fill us in on how the two are connected. All right. Thank you, Tim. So the Girl Scouts of Northern California is, is basically a membership organization. So we have 50,000 girl and adult members, and we sell Girl Scout merchandise um, through six physical stores at our larger offices. So in those stores, we've got eight registers, and we also have three mobile store computers that travel to various camps and activities throughout the year. Uh, we utilize Microsoft's Retail Management System 2.0, and we process about 1.5 million in sales each year, and about 75,000 of that is through our mobile stores. Uh, we've got a pretty large area uh, in the country. We're covering the San Francisco Bay Area north up to the Oregon border. 
and connecting our offices is a private MPLS network with three points of internet egress. Uh, we do have one server dedicated to uh, Tripwire Enterprise, the compliance manager and the log center products. And we also use the file integrity monitoring, change detection and compliance, and the log center um, collects data from our Active Directory, our firewalls, our devices, routers, switches, and firewalls. And then we've got agents on our servers and point of sale computers to collect the file integrity monitoring data. Uh, our audit process is done via self-assessment, and we utilize the prioritized approach for PCI data security standards. Uh, and, we, and we use this to work through the roughly 260 individual line items that, that need to be checked and validated. Um, if you've not used it, uh, it's a great tool. Uh, and since we don't store credit card data anywhere within our organization, we only utilize a QSA every five years. So year, year to year, we, we do self-assessments, and then once every five years, we, we bring in a, a qualified security assessor. We've also implemented a pretty rigorous change management process to log, plan, and test all the changes that we release to our environment. Um, and this includes regular Windows updates, and as well as individual application patches. So we leverage the, the Tripwire file integrity management agents and the network security agents to pull and report those changes to these critical systems. And then lastly, we utilize a third party to perform both external and internal penetration testing and, um, and vulnerability assessments each year. So Glenn, you, you mentioned, I, I didn't realize that the, the Girl Scouts um, of Northern California had physical retail locations. It's not something I would normally associate with um, um, the Girl Scouts, but that, that's true. You said you have six of them, is that right? Yes, yes, we have six physical stores and then three mobile registers that, that travel about the, the, the northern part of the state. Now, uh, this might be the most important uh, piece of information that, that, that we have in the webinar. Can you buy the cookies year-round at those physical stores? <laughs> no, the, the cookies are only available one time of year, uh, and that's after the sale. So any of the uh, excess inventory that we have, because we pre-order all those million boxes of cookies, and then anything we have left over, we either donate to um, charities or uh, military overseas programs or uh, sell in, in the physical stores. Oh, I thought I had found a loophole there. Uh, sorry, any, <laughs> anything else that you wanted to share about the, the, the environment uh, before we move on? No, I think, I think that's it. All right. So uh, one of the things that, that's helpful to do when we're talking about um, the PCI DSS, and specifically we're, we're focused on requirement 11 here, is to actually remind ourselves what's in that requirement. Um, often uh, the PCI requirements or any compliance regime, uh, has, you know, the specific requirements, which, which have lots of detail, often get summarized um, you know, with a, a short phrase. Um, but there's a lot in requirement 11, and it's worth, worth noting what's there. Um, the, the headline for the requirement is that you know, regularly test security systems and processes. Um, within that, uh, Glenn and I took the time to just sort of divide that up into um, three categories um, that you can see labeled here. So within the, the process and procedure category, uh, you've got the need to um, identify wireless access points, um, you know, and that, that includes uh, keeping an inventory of them, monitoring them, having an incident response plan if something happens to them. Um, and uh, for those of you who've been around the, the PCI DSS for a while, um, you might recall that, um, you know, there have uh, the inclusion of wireless access points as a, a separate uh, distinct requirement um, was born out of specific incidents that occurred where uh, wireless access points were the, the uh, point of, of ingress for attackers stealing credit card data. Um, you also have in this requirement the internal and external vulnerability scanning, which um, Glenn mentioned. So that includes the need to regularly scan uh, inside of your environment for vulnerabilities and to um, perform external scanning uh, using a, a, a PCI approved scanning vendor or an ASV. Um, the penetration testing requirements are in there. 
Um, and there are also requirements around segmentation of the network, uh, intrusion detection, change detection, uh, and, uh, and file integrity monitoring, those two, uh, and some security policy requirements as well. So that's the policies and procedures requirements. The interesting way that I tend to think about the requirement is that you've got um, you've got a set of requirements that generate a need for a set of tools or a set of vendors. So in order to fulfill those requirements, you've got to have, you know, the people in the process internally, but then you also have to acquire the technology uh, to support the, the people in process. And once you've done that, you know, those break out into the, the you know, categories that map to the, the actual requirements. Uh, once you've done that, you don't want to go into an audit um, without having actually tested what you've put in place. So it's important to validate that the tools you've acquired and the processes you've put in place actually um, fulfill the requirements uh, uh, that, that are in place. So in the case of requirement 11, you've got to be able to test your network segmentation. You've got to be able to validate that you're running vulnerability scans. You've got to be able to validate that the change detection uh, is actually working, that it's configured for the right um, critical files as required by the, the the DSS as well. So requirement 11, if you if you had a, a summary that it's, you know, it's the FIM requirement or it's the VA requirement, um, it actually includes all of these pieces. And so it's relatively, relatively complicated uh, to um, assess. Um, so that's my perspective from the, the tripwire side of things. But but Glenn is the one who who's, you know, living with the, the challenges of, of implementing tools and, and processes. Uh, what challenges and considerations for requirement 11 are most relevant for you, Glenn? Well, as you mentioned, you know, a large part of that is is establishing your methodology, documenting your processes, and not only identifying those changes, but how you're going to respond to them. Um, the, the big challenges, of course, are are actually performing those tests because uh, you do need a good set of tools, um, and then of course remediating. You, you've you've got to um, address all of your high risk vulnerabilities. So that means you know, scanning, testing, fixing, and then scanning and testing again until you've cleared up those those high risk issues. Um, it it's important to note that the requirement calls out for qualified personnel, um, although that's not specifically defined, defined, so that could be a vendor, could be a person on your staff that's well trained in this area, but it's a, a very cyclical process of, of uh, testing, fixing, and testing again to verify. Um, 11, requirement 11 also calls out that after you make changes, to your environment, to your infrastructure, that you've got to test again. So it's not just regular testing, it's testing after you've made changes. You've updated firmware on your firewalls, you've deployed a new location, you've uh, turned up a new internet uh, point of egress. So anytime you're making changes, the requirement is very specific, stating that you've got to then go through and test, make sure all of your controls um, are in place. And if you've got a large infrastructure, you've got a large environment where things are constantly changing, that can become a huge task itself. So one of the things that, that we try to do is reduce the amount of change so that we don't have changes going on every day, every week. Uh, we, we try to group those into uh, change releases that are two or three times each month. And then, of course, intrusion detection is, is challenging, again, because you've got to have tools that are capturing that information and then um, tools that, that are monitoring those logs and, and generating those alerts so that you can, so that you've got awareness of, of what's going on. Um, and it may seem rudimentary, but you've got to ensure those devices have the adequate level of logging to detect those intrusions. Not not always are the default configs going to give you a level of detail that you that you need to, to generate those alerts. So that's something you have to work through very carefully. Um, change detection. You know this this is where file integrity monitoring really comes into play. You you have to monitor and log all of the files in your point of sale computers, and you need a way to alert you about changes. Um, without 
a good tool to help you with that, that's nearly impossible. So uh, this is this is a big big element of uh, of the compliance. And you've also, when you've got a tool in place, you need the ability to identify critical and non-critical files that are changing, so that you can key on the changes that are important, and you know not chasing after changes related to someone's profile or desktops uh, shortcuts, as as an example. You you want to know what subsets uh, of files to focus on. I and think then, that's an important point, actually, is that that you can go – there are a lot of changes that occur in the environment that, that might be benign or part of, you know, standard operating procedure or not relevant to either compliance or security, and you've got to be able to tell the difference in the in the tool that you're using. Is that right, Glenn? Exactly, exactly. It's uh, – you can spend hours trying to chase down, you know, why a uh, – you know, a specific file changed, and if you know that it's related specifically to a, a Microsoft patch, um, or you know it's in an area of the user profile that really doesn't matter, um, you can you can save yourself a whole lot of time. So then, interestingly, the, oh, go ahead, Glenn. Sorry. I was just going to say the 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 other part of the requirement is to monitor these changes on a weekly basis, as as it's called out in Section 11.5. And personally, uh, I think this is a daily a daily task. You, you have to check these configs and these changes every day uh, through your file integrity monitoring. Because if you wait uh, a week to find out systems have been compromised, a whole lot of damage can occur during that time. So this is something that we do every day, checking for, for changes. And then, you know, again, we touched on the fact that you've got to test after changes are made to your environment. So if you're monitoring changes on a, a, a daily basis, it sounds like you're you're approaching uh, – PCI DSS compliance from rather than from a, a point in time approach, you know, that we have a, an audit coming up, either internal or external. So we have to achieve compliance for that audit, but more from a continuous approach um, where you maintain compliance over time. Is that right? Exactly. You know, there, there's been enough cases documented of uh, organizations that have not done this. You know, they've been compromised for months, sometimes years, and you know, they, they just didn't know. And and that has to be because they didn't have baselines that they weren't checking uh, for these file changes. And you know, it's just such a huge risk if if you're compromised. It, it's you know, obviously affecting all of your customers and your credibility, but there's also, you know, potential monetary fines and and and, and damage that can be done. So well, surprisingly, we have a, a next slide that talks about the uh, the the subject of continuous compliance. I, I had no idea it was coming next. <laughs> yeah, so this this slide has a, a, a sarcastic title for for many of those reasons we just spoke about, um, because it's it's not just you know a one time shot for your audit and make sure that you're ready. You really, in my opinion, you've got to monitor your your environment every day. Um, there there aren't any days off. Uh, the bad guys don't take a long Fourth of July holiday. Uh, so, you know, it's it's something that that uh, I believe that that has to be done every day. And and you know, having good tool set there helps helps you to accomplish that without a whole lot of time. Um, and you've also got to ensure that all your security systems, file servers, your point of sale computers are kept up to date. You've got to make sure that those engines and signatures are, are up to date. Um, there, there are banking organizations, unfortunately, that, that don't even maintain uh, patch levels on their systems until they get audited, they, they don't know. So you know, it's something that you've got to stay on top of. And then, as we've alluded to, baselines. You've got to have baselines on all of your devices in your in your environment, all the routers, all the switches, all the firewalls, your point-of-sale computers, 
you, you've got to know what those file versions are so that you can detect change to those critical systems. And you know, I, I can't imagine accomplishing that without you know, a, a product like uh, the log center and the file integrity monitoring to, to do that because it's just probably not possible manually. And then, um, yeah, I, I, go ahead. We uh, we've 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 definitely seen customers who've who've come to us with um, in a position where they've they've put in place a a product that that achieves the the requirement of 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 a particular compliance um, standard, but ultimately isn't operationally functional for them. So they might be storing logs as required, or they might be detecting change as required, but because they can't manage those uh, results as effectively, uh, they they have exactly the problems that, that you're describing. Right, right. And it's it takes a, a lot of um, preparation and coordination and communication to make sure that that you're actually doing something with all the information. It, you know, it's easy to collect the data, and doing something with it is, you know, the next step. So, and I was just going to say you first one fi final point on on this slide that. I think it's really important to establish a, a very solid, almost rigorous change management policy and procedure. Because if that procedure is done well, it ensures that your teams are communicating about changes, that you're preparing for those, and, and releasing them in a, in a controlled fashion so that you're not, with the requirement to have to test after all changes, you know, that, that can be just an endless process. So. Getting a good, strong handle on your change process, I think, is is critical. And that that really goes towards the the cost of compliance. I think um, there was a um, last year, which is still the most recent Verizon. Uh, we're all familiar with the the Verizon uh, data breach uh, report, but they also do a, a PCI report. Verizon does lots of PCI consulting. And last year, the most recent PCI report they put out uh, had some interesting results. Uh, it pointed out that um, the majority, you know, it, I think it was high 90s, 90 percent of organizations pass their PCI audits, but that that uh, percentage drops off significantly for interim audits. Uh, in other words, um, organizations are, um, in Verizon's experience, uh, achieving compliance at the time of the audit, but then letting it fall off after the audit. So in between audits, they become non-compliant, and then they have to expend all of that work and energy to become compliant again. And by implementing a process of continuous compliance, you're keeping the distance between reality and compliant as close as possible over time. So ultimately, um, you do less work over a longer period of time. It costs less to, to maintain compliance. Exactly. Because addressing the problems and challenges that you find when you quickly try to get clear and ready um, is, is a huge task. So we found that breaking that up and doing a little bit of it every day keeps us keeps us prepared. And it probably keeps you sane too. Firm. It does. Um, I, I, I was going to say that it's it's one of the things that allows me to sleep well at night because PCI compliance can be very onerous. It's and and there's some risk there too, as we as we mentioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So compliance isn't the only benefit, however, of of this approach. I mean, part of the the point of this this webcast was to look at how uh, you know you sort of go beyond the checkbox, and we talked about how the implementing uh, tools that are more comprehensive can help you, um, you know, not just check the box for compliance, but achieve and maintain compliance at a lower cost. But there are also additional benefits um, sort of beyond the, the checklist that we wanted to talk about. Um, and the first one here was really um, the subject of, of security versus compliance. Um, so Glenn, you know, you've, you've implemented a set of tools that are targeted at 
um, achieving PCI compliance, but it, it sounds like there might be some security benefits as well beyond just the, the compliance piece. Is that right? There, there is. And part of that is is keeping an eye on those devices that you have out there and and validating the, the changes that, that you're making as well. Um, you know, that when things go south in, in an organization or an application, it's usually the changes that are made to that environment. So um, being able to test ensures that your security procedures, your processes um, are intact. And, and because we tie our change management into our, our daily monitoring, we are able to gain some big efficiencies because we, we basically reconcile the changes we find to our change log. So we go into a day and, and we expect to see specific changes to specific systems whether it's firewall rules or, or a point of sale equipment upgrade. And so when we see those, we know, oh yeah, check that off. We promote that to the baseline and we go on, on to the next item. So we, we save hours and hours every day, every week by staying on top of all, all the change. And, and it ensures that our security processes, our security procedures are are kept up to date. And you mentioned the the PCI requirement of, of weekly change detection versus daily change detection and that 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 time window is important I think for understanding how you can get more out of a, a change detection product uh, that's you know targeted at compliance. If you're reviewing changes daily, the window of opportunity for a malicious change to exist in the environment is much shorter. Um, so if something has been changed, e even a not malicious, but, a, you know, security relevant accidental change gets detected sooner and remediated faster, closing that, that window of opportunity for attackers, uh, you know, faster than you would if you if you reviewed them less frequently. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I you also you mentioned it's it's just a huge window of opportunity for things to go south. Yeah, that's true. Um, you also mentioned some, of, without saying it directly, the, the operational benefits um, that that you've experienced from sort of the daily change monitoring uh, in terms of of time savings specifically. So if you um, now that you've put in place a you know a more rigorous change management process that involves you know detecting the changes and reconciling them, um, you don't spend as much time researching changes that might have occurred that you didn't didn't expect or didn't understand because you've, you've created that, that, um, that process internally. Correct. Correct. You know, if the, the, the changes that are reported and can take a lot of time to validate that their key files were changed as a result of, a, of a security patch, for example. Um, so if you're expecting those, you know, they're going to be changing. It's, it, it's a lot less time to validate those than it is to research each change that comes up. And, you know, and again, depending upon how often that change is occurring in your environment, um, you know, that, that can be, you could, you could have a full team doing nothing but verifying changes that, that get reported, changes to critical files, critical systems. So if you can tie in your change control process to your auditing, you can you can really get some huge time savings out of that. And of course, if you if you don't spend time reviewing the changes that are occurring in your environment, not only do you you uh, are you you know non-compliant, you're also putting yourself at risk because, as you pointed out, uh, you know most, uh, if not all, uh, compromises or uh, failures, uh, you know, stem from some kind of change. And I, I'd, I'd amend you said a change in your environment, which is is a piece of the equation. Um, external changes, of course, can occur as well. So, you know, new vulnerabilities get published and things like that. Uh, 
but monitoring your environment for changes is a, is a huge part of um, making sure that you stay secure. Yes, it is. It, it really is core to the whole the whole security and, and the compliance. So I want to uh, thank you, Glenn, for spending the time to talk about how Girl Scouts of Northern California has um, worked towards BCI compliance and the benefits that you get, um, you know, both in regards to, to compliance and, and beyond, and, and shift a little bit to, um, you know, the, the future of, of the PCI DSS, uh, you know, that's, um, that's coming. Uh, the current version is, is now uh, 3.2, so there was a, a PCI DSS 3.1 uh, that was published and made some changes, but 3.2 is the most recent. Uh, and we've put uh, some of the changes up here, um, obviously not in all the detail that's available because it won't fit on a slide, but uh, a summary uh, for those of you who haven't had time to, to look into it, um, and uh, also some of the, the compliance dates. So with 3.2, there's in general some time here. Um, we've got a, a new requirement around 6, 646, which um, is all about um, change control verification, and that's an interesting one. Um, because it, it, it touches on uh, on validation of compliance after changes occur in the environment, which sounds very similar to what we were talking about with Requirement 11, but there are some, some distinctions there. Uh, and they call this out as a best practice now uh, and a, a requirement after January 31st, uh, 2018. There are also some changes in 3.2 around multi-factor authentication um, and expanding the requirement to have uh, multi-factor authentication for all access to the cardholder data environment. Um, again, targeted, uh, labeled as a best practice now with a requirement after January 31st, 2018. Uh, and then uh, there were also some clarifications around the encryption requirements that were published in, in uh, DSS 3.1. Uh, and this was an interesting one because it was, um, I think often folks interpret this requirement or heard about this requirement and said, oh, you know, we can't, we can't use, uh, you know, SSL, uh, protocols or early TLS, TLS version one, basically, anymore. Um, but there are two pieces to the requirement. So right now, immediately, um, you're not allowed to deploy uh, new systems that use older encryption. Uh, so any SSL, uh, V2, V3, and TLS V1 are prohibited. Uh, and that includes, um, you know, any protocol that uh, or any service that might use one of those encryption methods. Um, and then you're also required to remove all of those versions uh, of encryption from your environment, your card world to data environment, by June 30th, 2018. So it's a, a two-piece requirement. And then uh, I'll point out that there were also a set of expanded requirements for service providers. Uh, Glenn is, is not a service provider, so um, it's not an area of focus for this webinar. But I, I'm curious, Glenn, as a, as a practitioner and someone who actually has to comply with, with PCI, um, which of these changes in 3.2, uh, you know, occupies your mind the most? Which are you, you most worried about or think will be the most work? Well, definitely the um, the encryption is is a huge piece. Um, everything everything we have today is SSL based, so the thought of removing that or changing over to a later version of TLS. I think is going to be a huge challenge, uh, not only for us but for the providers that that we process through. Um, I, I think we're in a pretty good place when it comes to the change control verification, just because of our practices today. And we've had multi-factor authentication in place for quite a number of years. Um, that's you know, relatively speaking, probably the, the easier area to tackle. Um, but then, you know, the, even though we're not a service provider, the, the the testing and the vulnerability scans um, are are important, and they're not always easy to do. You've you've got to have. Uh, investment in the tools or an investment in vendors to get that done. Yeah. Uh, on the encryption requirement, it, it jumps out at me. You know, you mentioned um, earlier on about, you know, establishing your relationships with vendors, uh, that there are a lot of different vendors in place to reach out to about the level of encryption they're using, when they'll be compliant, if they're compliant now. Um, you know, that's, it's not necessarily technical work there that needs to happen, but, uh, 
you know, an inventory and a, an assessment is is um, a fair amount of work. Exactly. I think you're, you're spot on because that is just getting an inventory of all of those processes um, and vendors is can be a huge list. You know, the, the, the technical piece is kind of the final step, but, you know, you, you've got to know who you need to start engaging in conversations. You, you've got to start planning for each of those systems to change. And, and of course, that has to be in conjunction with your service providers. So just because you as a card processor might be ready to, to make some changes, that doesn't mean your providers are on the same page with you. True, true. So it'll be interesting to see how, uh, you know, the, the industry progresses towards um, compliance with, with um, PCI DSS 3.2. And there will, there will, of course, be more changes from the, the PCI Council as things move forward. I'm sure we'll see uh, future versions as well. So best to keep an eye on and, and, uh, and maybe we'll have a chance to discuss it again on a, on a webinar. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to move on to uh, a little bit about how Tripwire can help with the uh, PCI compliance challenges that, um, that uh, customers face uh, and uh, put up a, a pretty chart for you. Uh, and not surprisingly, we uh, can help with all, uh, all of the 12 requirements. So we actually categorize um, our ability to help in different ways. Um, you know, it's not simply that Tripwire has a product that, that provides uh, a control for each of these requirements. A lot of what Tripwire is able to do is validate different controls in place um, for uh, change detection, file integrity monitoring, um, as, as we've discussed in this, this webinar. Tripwire provides a product directly. Um, also for um, log collection, we provide a product directly and vulnerability scanning as well. Uh, but for many of the requirements, um, we can use the products that we have to the requirement is in place to produce evidence that that um, control is in place. Uh, and uh, make audits go uh, faster and smoother by supplying uh, a, the, the evidence required at, at your fingertips. Um, and we do that, of course, uh, with a set of products uh, as well. So if you're not familiar with um, the Tripwire product line or, or only familiar with some of the products, here's a, a relatively comprehensive list. Um, Tripwire Enterprise uh, and Tripwire Configuration Compliance Manager uh, provide our uh, policy compliance and secure configuration uh, management capabilities that includes file integrity monitoring and change detection. Um, so they're, they're core and key to our PCI compliance solution. Uh, Tripwire Log Center provides secure and reliable log collection, both agent-based and uh, agent-less, uh, depending on the, the type of, of system you, you want to collect logs from. Uh, it collects the logs, stores them uh, in compliance with PCI, gives you the ability to, to search through them and, uh, and generate uh, uh, correlated events as well. Tripwire IP360 is our vulnerability management product, uh, which is an appliance-based uh, solution that you can deploy to conduct internal vulnerability scans in your environment, uh, collect results, uh, and uh, 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 review them in accordance with the, the requirements of PCI around uh, vulnerability scoring. Tripwire Pure Cloud uh, is an external uh, cloud-based service that provides our approved scanning vendor or ASV service. So. Uh, if you, um, you know, have requirements for PCI compliance, you have requirements for an ASV to do your external scans, and uh, Tripar can provide that with Pure Cloud. In regards to the new requirements in uh, the DSS 3.2, I wanted to address a little bit about how Tripar uh, can help with those specifically. Um, with 646, uh, which was that change control verification requirement, um, obviously, uh, Tripwire is in a great position with Tripwire Enterprise to automate um, validation of those DSS of DSS compliance on on systems after a change. Um, so not only does Tripwire detect changes in the environment, uh, you can also use the the PCI DSS policies in Tripwire to validate whether a system is compliant or not. You can of course customize those policies uh, to um, your requirements as well. With the multi-factor authentication piece, uh, again, Tripwire is in a position to, to validate uh, that multi-factor authentication is in place on systems in the cardholder data environment. So you can uh, use Tripwire to ensure that uh, systems are configured appropriately to require multi-factor authentication as you've, you've required, uh, as is now required by um, uh, the PCI DSS in 3.2. And then the service provider requirements um, which I said, you know, aren't, aren't a focus for this webinar necessarily. There are three of them. 
uh, that are uh, added in 3.2. And again, this is a validation piece for um, Tripwire. Uh, we can uh, validate that those controls are in place for service providers. And then finally, the encryption requirement, um, which gets spread across three specific requirements in the, the DSS, uh, is an interesting one. Uh, Tripwire can help in a couple of different ways here. Uh, Tripwire IP360 actually can be used to scan the environment and discover where uh, um, weak or prohibited encryption is in place um, and, and can do that across multiple protocols. So um, certainly if uh, a, an open network port is presenting uh, SSL or TLS version one, um, Tripwire IP360 can detect that and provide you an inventory of those devices. It will also identify those encryption algorithms on um, services like uh, databases and uh, you know mail servers, um, IMAP and uh, POP and uh, a variety of other services that can present um, an encrypted option as well. Uh, and that inventory can provide you with the ability to uh, go out and remediate those systems uh, and to uh, uh, ensure that you're not deploying new uh, new systems that violate the encryption requirements as well. Of course, uh, beyond PCI, um, Tripwire can help with uh, a number of things. Uh, as we talked about with, with Glenn, uh, Tripwire products can be used for a variety of continuous monitoring capabilities. Um, we talked specifically about change detection, which is a, a core capability for us, identifying Change in the environment, uh, who made a change, um, has benefits well beyond compliance, um, certainly relevant to security, uh, very helpful in identifying malicious events. And a lot of uh, what Tripwire does around vulnerability scanning and um, configuration uh, auditing as well goes towards overall risk reduction in the environment. So if your goal is uh, to prevent breaches from occurring rather than detect them, uh, then reducing risk, reducing your attack surface is an important aspect of that, and we can help. Uh, of course, uh, preventing every uh, breach is, um, is a near impossibility, so we, we do focus as well on uh, threat detection and response. Uh, so change detection is a, is a core capability for identifying threats in the environment, identifying suspicious or malicious changes, allows you to um, recognize uh, events that, that may be out of um, outside your standard operating uh, you know uh, procedures and um, and investigate them and that's the response portion of it um, you know with Tripar log center you can identify what events have occurred on hosts that were logged uh, and uh, with Tripar enterprise you can dig into what changed on a host and how that host may be um, compromised uh, and we did talk a bit about um, operational cost reduction as well. Um, you know, obviously our, our goal is to, to deliver products uh, that not only have great capabilities, but have great value for our customers, uh, that improve efficiency, um, that let you build better relationships inside of your environment by being able to communicate more effectively about what's changing in the environment. Uh, and a lot of that goes towards increased efficiency and, and cost reduction as well. Uh, and, uh, with that, um, we'll summarize that um, you know, Tripwire is, is able to help in a number of ways, and um, we're pretty excited about the opportunity. And uh, we're excited to have, have Glenn on this webinar as well, and hopefully it was, it was useful for everyone, uh, and that you learned a little bit uh, about um, PCI compliance and um, how you might address it, uh, whether you do so with, with Tripwire or not. Uh, and with that, I will move to questions, if there are any. Um, as Kate mentioned at the beginning, you can input questions in the Q&A uh, section of the, the application, uh, and uh, we'll take a look and, and read the questions and answer them as best we can. Um, so feel free to take a minute to, to do that, and uh, let's take a look and, and see what questions we have in there. And it looks like, uh, Glenn, this was a, a question for you that was submitted, um, and I think it goes back to something you were you said at the <laughs> at the uh, the very beginning. Uh, you uh, described the audit process that um, the Girl Scouts of Northern California go through, and uh, there was a request to, to describe that again, to repeat that. Sure. Um, so we use uh, a self-assessment, and to work through that assessment, we use uh, one of the PCI DSS documents that's published that's called the Prioritized Approach for PCI Data Security Standards Requirements. And this is basically a, a spreadsheet with every section of the PCI data security standards broken out by subpoints and the specific requirements. Um, approximately 260 line items, and 
that's that's the tool that that we constantly review and go through. Um, and then I think the last thought was that we use a, a QSA uh, qualified security assessor every fifth year to bring in a third party to um, to go through uh, the audit process. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Uh, I've got a, another question here. Um, is there a difference between file integrity monitoring and change detection, uh, which is required for PCI compliance? Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer that one. Uh, so the PCI DSS has gone through a, a, a number of, of revisions, as you can imagine. The original uh, requirement specified file integrity monitoring products, um, and um, you know specifically for monitoring uh, critical system files, I think was the, the term that was used in that original specification. Um, over time, and if I recall correctly, I think it was in the 3.0 version, uh, that uh, requirement was expanded to say something like use change detection products like a file integrity monitoring product. Um, so I think that um, some of the changes in technology and capabilities in the market um, you know, pushed the PCI Council to broaden that requirement so that um, you know, change detection was really the, the the requirement, not just um, file integrity monitoring, which could be a narrower, uh, interpreted more narrowly. Um, so in essence, change detection is what's required for PCI compliance. File integrity monitoring is one capability that you can use to fulfill that requirement. Um, in the case of, of Tripwire, we provide both um, change detection and file integrity monitoring. So we, we cover the requirement uh, regardless. All right, uh, so we've got another question here. Um, and uh, let's see, are are all computers on my network subject to the PCI requirements if they don't actually process any credit card transactions? Um, Glenn, did you want to answer that one? Sure, and the answer is yes. Every device, every computer within your network um, falls within scope, and, and that's why it's important to segment your point of sale environment from the rest of your network because that reduces your scope considerably. Now, that, that doesn't mean you don't have to test your segmentation because that's actually called out in, in the requirements, but it narrows your scope. So every device on your network, every router, every switch falls into scope. Yeah, so this goes to the term cardholder data environment, which gets used and defined in the PCI DSS um, as well. And, and one of the, the goals, um, I think, for, for compliance purposes is to reduce the size and scope of your cardholder data environment through through segmentation as much as possible. And then you have then you have less to compliance area to, to worry about. Exactly. Okay. And let's see, uh, we've got uh, another question here. Can you explain the primary difference between uh, Tripwire Enterprise and, and CCM? Um, I'm happy to, to take that one. Uh, so Tripwire Enterprise is um, primarily an agent-based uh, product. So it uses um, agents to collect the data that it collects. Um, Configuration Compliance Manager is primarily an agentless product. So it uses um, authenticated connections to hosts. Uh, in order to collect the data. In many cases, the data they collect is the same. There are, there are a lot of um, you know, smaller feature differences as well uh, in, in how the products work, but, um, and the data they collect is the same. Uh, key difference, Tripwire Enterprise, because of the agent uh, approach, is able to display more detailed information about some of the changes that it detects. Uh, so for uh, that beyond the, the checklist uh, kind of approach, you get more detailed information out of Tripwire Enterprise when you're looking at, at and reviewing the changes. Um, the two products do share the same policy content. So, um, you know, if you if you want PCI compliance policies, the same policy exists in, in both of those products. They just have different focuses in how they collect the data. All right, let's see. We have another question here. Uh, Can Tripwire monitor my firewalls and switches as well as my point of sale computers? Um, I can answer that one. Yes. Um, in the case of uh, devices like firewalls and switches that don't 
uh, support the installation of an agent. Uh, we do monitor them agentlessly, regardless of, of which um, which product you end up using. And I think that's it for the questions. Um, unless there are any last minute submissions, now is your, your last chance to submit a question before we close out uh, the webinar. And if there, if there aren't any more questions, um, I'd, I'd first of all like to thank Glenn for his time. It's very generous of you to spend the time with us, not only to prepare for a, a webinar, but also to present it. Uh, and then I'd like to thank everyone who attended um, for spending the time with us. I really do hope it was, it was helpful uh, and that you learned something. And if you have questions or uh, follow-up, feel free to reach out to us. Um, Kate uh, uh, explained how to, to um, obtain our contact information. And of course, um, if you have questions about Tripwire, we're, we're always here to, to answer them. So thanks again. Yes, thank you, Tim, um, and thank you, Glenn, very much for the presentation today. And thank you to our audience for attending today. We hope that you found the presentation informative and useful to you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand version of the webcast and the slide deck. Also, if you'd like to receive proof of attendance for this webcast, please respond to the follow-up email. So we hope you'll join us on future webcasts. You can check out our schedule at tripwire.com. Also, while you're there, check out our award-winning blog, The State of Security, to find the latest in security news as well as thought-provoking security topics. Thank you, and have a great day.